oh, a very big difference. <laughs> um, the, uh, the people who brought us the global financial crisis um, uh, in Wall Street uh, were very knowledgeable people. Uh, so uh, knowledge alone is, is simply not enough. Uh, it's interesting that you know, when we look in philosophy and in literature, we can often find useful things that can guide us. And in 1934, T.S. Eliot, in a poem called The Rock, uh, said this, where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? And then about 50 years later, Russell Ackoff, who was a, an academic at Wharton Business School and um, also a, a business analyst, came up with the notion of data, information, knowledge and wisdom. Clearly a, um, a, a distinction between those four elements. Now, we all know that we have more information than we can possibly deal with, more data than we can possibly deal with. We've now developed the notion of a zettabyte, uh, which I think is 10 to the 21 uh, uh, bits of information. You know, we used, remember when we used to think that, you know, terabytes were pretty darn big? Well, now we've got zettabytes. So the human mind obviously cannot possibly comprehend that amount of data. Um, indeed, forming that data into information sets is, is also uh, enormously difficult. The other factor that we have to take into account is what Herb Simon called bounded rationality. Uh, and by that we mean that people are not necessarily um, the sort of rational beings that we would like to think that they are in two ways. First of all, um, when we make decisions, we now know that we make decisions not just on what we would call reasoning processes, but we do bring into account uh, elements of intuition, elements of experience. We draw on various bits of knowledge that we have from the past uh, and emotions. So, um, so we don't make purely rational decisions anyway, that we know that that's, that's incorrect. The second point about bounded rationality is that the human brain simply cannot deal with more than, say, that the general uh, accepted point is around about seven bits of information. And once we get beyond that, the brain starts to go, well, <laughs> I can't handle this anymore. So we have bounded rationality. Um, now, a lot of the um, evidence now shows that what people really do, what leaders really do when they make a decision is that they make a call uh, which is what we would call intuitive, but it doesn't just mean a gut feeling. You know, anyone can have a gut feeling. We all have gut feelings. But a leader has a gut feeling of intuition that is based on huge amounts of experience and knowledge but also it's based on their reflexivity. That is, they've made a call sometime, it, uh, it went belly up, and they go, goodness me, that, <laughs> that didn't go so well. Um, what went wrong there? So they, they need reflexivity as well. So when I say gut feel or intuition, I don't just mean that people you know, say, oh, I think this is the way we'll go. They, they have a, an intuitive understanding that this is the right way to go. And Having made that decision, what we now know is that people are then able to what I call backfill with rationality. They can then go, I've now got the answer, now I'm going to look at the building blocks that led to that answer. And, and that's, that's the way generally, uh, generally people work. Now, the point about having that sort of intuitive judgment uh, and the difference between knowledge and wisdom is that that intuitive judgment must be characterised by a number of things, obviously experience, but of course a wise person crucially has to have the characteristic of a moral being. Uh, they have to be virtuous in, in the sense that they are not doing this for their own benefit, they're not just thinking only of the firm's profit line or whatever, they're thinking of the general benefit. So, so again, it gets back to that disposition 
element that I was talking about. Uh, people who make these calls, if they have the right disposition, if they continue to think and reflect on what they've done and how those things turned out, then those sort of intuitive judgments will generally turn out to be pretty good ones. Tricky, isn't it? Um, I tell people that there aren't too many diagrams in management science they need to remember, but the, the D-I-K-Y um, pyramid or triangle is one of them because it needs to remind us how important that stuff is, particularly the, that little layer between data and information where you have to analyse stuff. And anyway, we're not talking about that. But certainly the knowledge component where effectively, you know, whatever information you take in, you take it in through your lenses and you turn it into something personal for you. And it becomes knowledge. And of course, I suppose in a, in a simple way, a simple model, you've got uh, explicit knowledge and you've got um, tacit knowledge. The explicit stuff you can spit back out again pretty easily. And most organisations that think they're doing knowledge management are just you know, collecting terabytes on their servers. And that's good stuff, really good stuff. But that's simply explicit knowledge turned back into information. Tacit stuff's the gold in organ platinum in organisations, the stuff that you know but you can't say, the deep stuff. And sometimes it's what you can do. Now, it's all very well to have people full of that stuff, but then they've got to be able to apply it. And to me, the difference is that wisdom provides you with the context in which to use your knowledge, to direct your knowledge appropriately. You know, I, can, I know a lot of knowledgeable people I wouldn't send to the shop to buy a bottle of milk. I'd probably go to the wrong shop and come back with something else. Um, to be wise, and again, it's an ancient concept, isn't it? The wise person of the village. Um, they've got a lot of knowledge, but they know when and where to apply it. You can find very knowledgeable people that can be in your ear all the day, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and that has become a nuisance. Or they're giving you, they're sharing their knowledge with you at inappropriate times, or the wrong sort of knowledge, you know, stuff that's outdated or it's not right for that particular moment. I think a wise person knows when and where and how to share their knowledge uh, to get results of some form, you know, whether it's purely to to aid in the growth of that particular person over a period of time or whether it's to solve a problem that they're facing at that particular time. And, the, and the, that sort of wisdom can come from a mentor, a person who is a knowledgeable person in your life who, who was there for the long run, but it's relatively passive, you know, and you can go and ask them things and they can, you know, like the old guru, when they say, well, son, in this is a situation, I believe that this is what you should be considering, you know. Uh, but they can be a coach as well, someone who's more actively involved in your life, helping you create a plan. And they can help direct that plan through uh, using their knowledge uh, appropriately with you, sharing that knowledge appropriately with you, maybe in just in the form of questions back to you or challenges, rather than telling you to do something. So, yeah, to me, you know, knowledge, knowledge is that very personal that personal filtering and storing of, of the information of the world uh, mixed in with your own predilections and your beliefs and your experiences. So you cook up this brew of stuff inside you, um, some of which can come out pretty easily and some of which can't, and that's your knowledge. But a wise person knows how to apply that, when and where and how to apply it.